school is pretty hard to avoid. Um, as most stuff that can happen, adults can also happen in children, and then they also have their own specific issues. Um, so what I'll try to do is I'll try to spend more time on topics that are new to paediatrics uh, and spend slightly less time on familiar topics that are then also presenting kids. Uh, I'm aware of the MedSoc lecture later, so I'll try to get through what we can now, but still give you guys a good break if you do want to go to that. Uh, and anything we don't cut, cover from today's lecture and all the stuff in my second lecture we can cover on Thursday. So what we'll do is basically start at the beginning with neonates. Um, so when a baby is born, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to dry the baby and make sure they're warm. Um, and then the second thing you've got to do is calculate your APGAR score. So I think it is worth knowing about the APGAR score and um, how to interpret it. Um, it's got like the little thing on the bottom left, which is what score and kind of what you do. And you do this APGAR score at one, five and ten minutes. Um, but we kind of will go through the one minute kind of the first assessment. Uh, so if the APGAR is high enough, so it's kind of seven to uh, ten, then you can just give the give the baby to mum. That's that's all good. Um, if it's four to six, then you want to try to stimulate the baby. So you'll rub the baby. You'll um, maybe uh, take a quick antenatal history off mum and then start to monitor them. And if you are at zero to three, so you're very low, that's when you're thinking at looking at the right hand side, uh, which is your kind of recess pathway. Um, so breathing and kind of ventilation is generally more important in kids than uh, than adults. Um, a lot of the causes of arrest in kids are more respiratory based and you'll see this in a few things where the respiration the ventilation is more heavily kind of uh more heavily put upon um so at first if you if you have no spontaneous rest uh, rest effort what you'll do is you'll give a burst of kind of breath to try and inflate the lungs so this is five breaths kind of back to back where if you think the uh the lungs are having trouble expanding you're trying to give them some help to inflate so then what you'll do is um you'll then assess the heart rate so if the heart rate improve increases with this then uh you're a bit more happy but if it doesn't or it stays very low then um what you can do is you can try you can make sure that these uh inflation breaths are going in so you'll check that the chest is rising and falling and that you are properly ventilated, that you're properly getting it breath in there. You might try another five, but if not, and the heart rate's still low, or still not coming up, then what you'll start to do is you'll start to ventilate the baby and start chest compressions. And if you still have no improvement, this is when you would definitely be wanting senior help um, because now it's the time for um, kind of drugs like IV adrenaline, uh and stuff like that and that's all handled by seniors uh and you wouldn't really be expected to start dealing with that um so sepsis from all, all that you know and love and know from fourth year so in in neonates it's really important to kind of go for early versus late onset because it has different causes as different organisms and therefore different antibiotics you'd start empirically so your early onset it's usually the sources from mum or from kind of some part of the process of the birth. Um, so maternal GBS, so group B strep uh, status is a big, uh, big factor because GBS is the most common culprit of this early onset sepsis in uh, neonates. And also just watch out for listeria. Um, so if, there, if a question gives you a kind of maternal consumption of unpasteurized milk or cheese or some kind of strange food really be on the lookout for listeria and uh clinically like a a good sign is if they have purulent conjunctivitis um that can kind of also give you a clue that it's uh listeria rather than any other bug um and then we move on to your late onset causes so this is more stuff from the environment so you can see kind of like catheters central lines anything kind of from the environment that could be causing infection in the, the child. Uh, and this is when your usual suspects, if you're kind of staff, 
your E. coli, this the stuff starts to appear and come more to the top of your lists. Um, another really important thing in kids is your septic screen. Um, this is because uh, sepsis can have a very non-specific presentation in children. Uh, they can just be just lethargic, just generally unwell temperature, and there's much less localizing signs that you get in adults. So if you get kind of a generally um, unwell and you, a kid and you think it's a infective process, what you need to do is your infective screen, uh, your septic screen, sorry. And so the ones that you have to have to do are your blood cultures, chest x-ray, lumbar puncture, and your urine, and the kind of the nasopharyngeal aspirate and the swab of skin lesions. Sometimes you can do if you think it's indicated, but those other four are your real bankers that you, you have to do. And just note at the bottom, the slightly different uh, paediatric sepsis sits from adults, a lot of the same kind of concepts, but just involving senior clinicians as you really shouldn't be dealing with any sick, sick kids on your own. And um, considering ionotropes more early, is they can really deteriorate quite quickly. It's very scary. So we're on to our first SBA. So hopefully the VVOX and everything should be working and I'll give you guys uh, some time to answer it. So the real key to this question, I think, is the cord prolapse, which is kind of snuck a little bit in the middle there, but you've got a real big cause of birth asphyxia uh, called prolapse. It can really cause profound hypoxia in the neonate as their entire kind of um, supply is cut off. Um, the other things that can start to kind of put other options down is the, the baby's born at term, so this makes your intraventricular hemorrhage slightly less uh, likely and uh, the fontanelles aren't tense so I'm trying to say that you're not thinking of raised ICP and your temperature and vital signs are normal kind of putting sepsis further down in your differentials because it is a common cause of neonatal seizures. So with that what we're looking at here is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy this is where you get a period of profound birth asphyxia or neonatal hypoxia, which can then cause brain, brain damage. So here are your, your differentials and your causes of neonatal seizures. And I've kind of put them with the relevant investigations that you want to do, either to look at the cause or if you're suspecting hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you're probably doing an MRI to look at any damage you might be dealing with. So the main ones for you to worry about are your infection and your electrolytes. This is because these are the ones that you'd be expected to deal with kind of on a day-to-day -day basis as a kind of F1. So what UCL will probably be looking at, uh, whereas anything else would probably be handled by specialists. So on to our second SBA. So here we have a preterm baby. He's got abdo signs and a pretty kind of haywire looking x-ray. 
uh, and this is also curling 10 days in fairly early in life. Um, and he really got to be thinking about neck or uh, necrotizing uh, enterocolitis. Um, so I've given a fairly short brief um, because I just wanted the best next steps, the, what you initially do. And here with them, you've got to rest the bowel and um, give any IV antibiotics because you're worried about if they do perforate, you want to have them on antibiotics. Now, if they had perforated or they were getting increasing distension that wasn't um, reacting to this first line management, that was when you would maybe think about going for uh, the laparotomy. But first, you want to rest the bowel and give them antibiotics. So um, at the top here in your problems of prematurity are the immediate problems and considerations in preterm babies. So kind of the pediatricians, NICU, will be ready and waiting to deal with these um, because they're very, very common. So hypothermia is a real thing. You've got to make sure they're kept warm very early. And respiratory distress syndrome is also very common, which I'll expand on in a second. So your other specific issues that you get in preterm babies. So we've mentioned the intraventricular hemorrhage. So this is very common in preterm babies, but rare in practically any other scenario. Um, so if, if you're looking at any neuro signs early in life for a preterm baby, you're thinking interventricular hemorrhage is at the top of what you're thinking. And there's quite a wide range of outcomes, actually. Many of them, many of them do quite well, but it can also uh, have fairly devastating long term side effects. It's a bit of a range of outcomes. Um, We'll talk a bit more about neck in a second. And then finally is your, your retinopathy. Um, so it's an important thing to keep an eye on. Um, and you'll actually see uh, Opfal will do like their regular round. They'll usually do it at the same time each week. Where they go around NICU screening for this. And it's just a, um, it's a retinopathy which is caused by prematurity. So here we're on to neck and it's a pathology pretty much exclusively seen in preterm babies. Uh, it should be your top differential and kind of first couple of weeks of life in any preterm child. In terms of your investigation, ABG is really important because you're looking for either ischemic bowel, any perforation or any sepsis if you have perforated as well. Uh, as we said before, you want to try and rest the bowel uh, by giving IV nutritional TPN and IV antibiotics if you're worried about perforation and you need surgeries if you get a you do get a perforation or progressive distension you're worried about them perforating. So this is some x-rays of neck and here we have the kind of most pathognomic sign uh, and it's shown where that pointer is. Um, so it's kind of like almost like a slightly bubbly appearance of the bowel wall you are getting air kind of trapped in between the layers of the bowel wall so there it kind of just looks like it's a bit bubbly almost i'm not that good at x-rays i need to describe it in as simple a way as possible so here we've got some of the other um signs you can see most of these are pretty kind of sba buzzwordsy but um one i can at least appreciate is this wriggler sign where you, if you've got air on both sides of the the bow that causes a really sharp nice line so you can see where the arrow is pointed you can make out really really nice bow wall um so you can see that and the other ones i think are more for sbas and i'm i don't think i'm going to pick them up at all so on to another sba
And that's the x-ray, sorry. Give you a sec to look at that and I'll go back. So what we have here is respiratory distress in a term baby and without much other information your most likely differential for that is TTN or transient tachypnea of the newborn. Um, so again the fact that born, the baby is born at term is, is key uh, because it puts respiratory distress syndrome further down on your list whereas if the baby was preterm that would be really top of your list. So I'll go through all of these options uh, later in the talk or in my other talk in some capacity. So now on to respiratory distress syndrome. So this happens because of a lack of alveolar surfactant in uh, production, uh, usually in preterm babies, because they only start producing it kind of fairly close to term, usually about week 34. Um, and because of this lack of surfactant, which is basically a lubricant, um, you need much higher pressure to try and inflate the, inflate the basically stiff lungs. So what happens is the after kind of a few breathing that and really trying to inflate these stiff lungs, you get the infant tiring and getting respiratory distress. Uh, one important thing to, to note is that respiratory distress and respiratory distress syndrome are different things. Respiratory distress is just kind of any any child that's kind of struggling to breathe, and you've got your nasal flaring, your quick breathing, your intercostal recession, everything like that. Whereas respiratory distress syndrome is that specifically caused by this lack of surfactant. Um, so it's, as I say, it's going to be the first thing in your mind when you've got an immediate respiratory distress in preterms. Um, you have a pretty hazy X-ray, like just pretty pretty generally cloudy and uh, the key treatment here is endotracheal surfactant so you need to deliver it right to the source through a tube. So there's kind of lots of similar terms uh, that also get caused lot, called lots of different things that wants to clear up. So the, f the first and the biggest one is bronchopulmonary dysplasia aka chronic lung disease and also can be called as well prematurity lung disease. Um, so this is long term consequences from the treatment of respiratory distress. So you've probably got to intubate these children, um, do your endotracheal surfactant and put them on high flow oxygen. And all of this can damage the lungs as well. And these can kind of have long term consequences. So there's a bit again, there's a bit of a range of outcomes. A lot of them do pretty well and just might have kind of asthma type syndrome or a bit of exercise limitation, but it can also cause long term lung difficulties, basically. Um, next, we go on to um, PPHN, so persistent high, uh, pulmonary hypertension in newborn. So this is where the pulmonary vessels do not vasodilate like they normally would. And this can happen due to a range of different diseases affecting the respiratory system that leads to a maintenance of this kind of fetal circulation. So just think of it as a result of all these different in, uh, insults that could happen to the baby rather than a specific disease en entity itself. And finally, you have pulmonary hypoplasia. So this is a pretty rare complication of only a couple of things. And this is what happens when the lungs don't have enough room to develop. So stuff like conge congenital diaphragmatic hernia or any large masses in the abdomen or thorax you can basically squash the lungs and mean they don't have enough room to properly develop. Then if we're looking at respiratory distress in the term infant, then this is when TTN comes right to the top. Um, you get cesarean section as a risk factor. Uh, this is because there's less pressure or kind of squashing of the baby almost when you do a cesarean and someone described it to me as the fluid isn't squashed out of the lungs basically. Um, I'm not sure how kind of scientifically correct that is but it helped me remember it. 
Um, and basically, if you've got respiratory distress in a newborn, you can kind of categorize it into one of three things. If they're preterm, your top bet is respiratory distress syndrome. If they're term, you're thinking TTN. And if they're post-term, then you're thinking meconium aspiration syndrome. So again, this if you've got a kind of a 42 weeker, it's any sign of meconium anywhere around the birth and they've got respiratory distress, you need to think about meconium aspiration. And for a purely SBA point, if it's a post-term baby, then you're, you're really looking at this. So I'll leave this more as it's kind of more OSCE stuff. And I do hopefully plan to kind of put out an OSCE pack after my second lecture. Hopefully I have time to complete it. Um, but I think it's important to know the main things you're looking for in the NIPE and the Guffrey. But I'll let you guys kind of look through that a bit more in your own time. And on to the next SBA. And then one more, there's a little double header. So jaundice in the first 24 hours of life is a red flag and you're thinking about kind of sepsis and infection or any condition that can cause hemolysis. Um, so for these babies in the first 24 hours of life, you'd skip the transcutaneous uh, bilirubin measuring and go straight to serum This is because it's more accurate and it tells you more as well. But if it was jaundice in kind of from one to 14 days, if they were born a term or one to 21 days, they're preterm, then you, they, you do a transcutaneous measurement first. This is because a lot more of the time, the cause then is benign, like stuff like breast milk jaundice. Um, so you go for a transcutaneous measurement first before um, going for serum, which involve kind of venipuncture of the baby and is unpleasant. So this, you've got now prolonged jaundice and you've got prolonged jaundice of a high conjugated bilirubin and that is biliary atresia until proven otherwise. Um, so your initial investigation would be your ultrasound, but again, UCL loves their tricky wording with kind of qualifying investigations. The best investigation to confirm would be a cholangi cholangioscopy. And you'd also probably do a liver biopsy as well to check for any damage. So neonatal jaundice is an incredibly important topic. Um, there's a bit of an overlap with physiology um, as more red blood cells are being broken down in newborns and the liver is actually worse at processing it. So there are, it's incredibly, incredibly common um, and your red flags are really important to know since there's so many babies that get neonatal jaundice, not many of them need treatment, not many of them have sinister pathology, so you need to be really acute at picking those out. Um, but again, it's most it's good to stress the most common cause and it's from 24 hours to 14 days in term baby is breast milk jaundice and it is completely harmless. 
Um, so if you get onto your pathological jaundice, um, so as I said, first 24 hours, you're thinking any cause of hemolysis or infection. And also in your prolonged jaundice, all your all your causes that you can cause in the first 24 hours, your spherocytosis, everything like that can also cause prolonged jaundice. But for SBA land, um, I think biliary trees is the most important thing to rule out. Um, and if you do have a baby with biliary atresia, uh, we've gone through the investigations, but your management is something called a Kazai procedure. It's where they laparoscopically resect uh, and repair the damaged bile ducts. So um, there are different graphs and different levels that you would treat in jaundice, and it's depending on your gestational age and kind of whether they're premature or not, basically. Um, so your main things are your, your phototherapy, really. There'll be a ton of babies, the little caps over their eyes, getting phototherapy um, and exchange, exchange transfusion if the levels are rising really quickly or um, uh, they're quite high. And one other thing that can be used is IVIG, but this is mainly in your kind of baby maternal mismatch stuff like your rhesus or your ABO impact incompatibility. So now we're on to pediatric emergencies. We'll start with a little no, you don't SBA. So in children, the collapse and BLS algorithm is different into adults. That's why I kind of really want to stress this. So we'll just move on to it. So um, as I said before, the respiratory arrest is more common in children and therefore kind of the algorithm, how you treat them is more suited to rest conditions. Um, so the important points and differences from the adults have kind of highlighted so if they're not breathing, you don't go straight to checking the circulation, you give them five rescue breaths. Um, you give 15 chest compressions to every two rescue breaths. And uh, depending on the size of the child, you can do chest compressions in different ways, which are down there. You can look at that a bit later. Um, so choking is very, very common in children. Uh, but it's pretty much the same management, except as you can see in the very young, you do chest thrusts rather than abdominal thrusts. Onto a new SBA. So you've got to be very careful with young kids. So under three months and sepsis can present very non-specifically and be quite difficult to detect in these. So if any concern, you probably want them seeing a specialist in hospital. Uh, so we'll move on to kind of the red flags that um, these, are thro these are from. So it looks a bit intimidating at first. I think most of these red flags are quite intuitive. So they're a very sick child or if you've got serious pathology suspected like bowel obstruction or serious neurological disease or meningitis. But I want to do an SBA on the temp ones because I always got caught out on it. So basically watch out for those temperature red flags. The rest of them, you can probably tell that something serious is going on from the signs. Um, and the important one to note is just I have a bad feeling about this baby. It's, there's a lot of scope for just kind of general gut feeling. Um, so 
I didn't I don't even need to memorize wet flag basically a lot of people talked about it on my peds lectures and I'd never heard it before and I got quite confused uh, but it's just what you want set out if you know you've got a very sick child on the way uh, again I don't think you need to kind of memorize it but I think it's just useful to see the different things that you're thinking about um, seizures so I've got the algorithm from nice just on the right and it's pretty much the same as in adults um, just thought I'd mention it but it should be what you know and love from fourth year um, again so from sepsis note it's slightly different sepsis six um, the uh, important thing is hypotension is a pretty late and bad sign in children. Um, don't be reassured by normal normal blood pressure. Um, and again, with the giving antibiotics in kind of under three months, it's just all of this kind of being overly cautious in the in the very young. So this child is got DK and they are shocked. So you want to go for the 20 mil per kilo fluid bolus and it's time to wade into the complicated thing that is fluids in DKA. So what the first question in DKA in children is basically what state are they generally in? So if they're completely well, which I'll admit you're pretty unlikely to get asked about by UCL. But if they're completely well, they don't like dehydrated, they feel fine, you can actually give them oral fluids and maybe think about even subcut insulin rather than IV. Then your second category is they're unwell, maybe feeling sick, they've got abdo pain, uh, they're dehydrated, but they're not clinically shocked. For in these, you would give a 10 mil per kilo fluid bolus. And the important thing about something later is that does get taken away from their maintenance. Um, and your final category of those is those who are clinically shocked. And so you would give those a 20 mil per kilo fluid bolus. You can give them additional fluid boluses uh, up to kind of 20 mil per kilo. And as we'll see later, these aren't taken away from the total maintenance. And the second question you want to initially ask yourself is how bad is their dehydration or acidosis? So as you can see, you can kind of quantify based on the, the bicarb and the blood pH. Um, I think they'll either give you a mild or severe one in the exam, mainly because the moderate category was only recently put in, so they won't have updated the questions and because 7% makes the maths pretty awkward. So what we're going to do now is try and show all of this kind of complicated stuff around it. We're going to take a 30 kilo child who's got severe DKA and kind of roll them through um, what their fluids would be. So just to clarify, 30 kilo child, severe DKA, but we're saying they're not shocked uh, because I want to go through that now. So how are we going to do their maintenance fluids? So on the right is how pay, pediatric maintenance fluids are usually calculated. So this is your 100 mil per kilo for your first 10 kilos, and then the 50 mil per kilo, and then 20 mil per kilo. So you can see uh, 10 kilogram, we need one liter, 20, 1.5. Now when you get to 30, they're going to need 1.7 liters. Now we need to deal with the fact that he's dehydrated because he's got DKA and he has a deficit of fluid. 
So remember we were saying he had severe DKA, so that was a 10% deficit. So that deficit is 10% of his body weight, so he's 30 kilos, therefore he has a 3 kilo or 3 litres deficit. But since he wasn't in shock, again, different DSBA, but here we're saying he wasn't in shock, the initial 10 mil per kilo bolus, i.e. he would have been given 300 millilitres, that is now taken away from that 3 litre deficit. So now the deficit is only 2,700 millilitres because we've given him that bolus at the start. And remember, and just a good note is that remember, if they're shocked, that 20 mil per kilo bolus isn't taken away here. So now we have the deficit count calculated, the deficit of 2,700, and we've got to replace this over the course of 48 hours. This is because we don't want to replace fluids too quickly because the risk of cerebral edema, which we'll talk about in a second. So you divide that deficit, the 2,700, by 48, and you, so you're replacing that deficit over 48 hours. Then now we get onto the other side. So now, as we said, he needed his 1.7 litres of maintenance, his normal maintenance fluids anyway. And so we need to divide this over 24 hours to give the rate he's given those, add it all together, and you finally get the total maintenance fluids uh, that you'd give per hour in this child. Again, I can speak to anyone at the end about this, like it took me a while to get this. Um, so you've got a bit of a busy slide here, but um, I want to basically include all the info. And most of this is the same as adults, really. But the real thing I want to stress is the regular neuroobs, and this is because of that risk of cerebral edema. So the signs are fairly non-specific neuro signs, um, and that's why it's key to do these regular neuroobs to look out for it. And your first line of management in real life is to be get a senior. You should not be dealing with this on your own. But uh, mannitol and hypertonic saline can help in a in SBA land. So on to meningitis again. Don't, don't won't dwell on this too much because all of what you learn in fourth year is always basically the same for kids because it's usually presented in children. But we'll do a quick recap. So basically, your investigations and management at every stage are kind of split in the guidelines into whether they have the non-blanching rash or not. And remember this non-blanching rash is a sign of men meningococcal septicemia, which is something quite specific. So you've got meningococcus in your bloodstream and that's actually causing a coagulation abnormality, which leads to purpuric rash. Um, so um, in GP, if you get them presenting, if they have the rash, you give the IM Ben pen and send them to hospital. If don't, you just send them straight to hospital. Um, you only need blood tests if, if you've got the rash. You wouldn't generally do an LP in these uh, people if they do have that non-blanching rash. Um, thing just to clear up, you don't always need to do a CT before LP. I know some people say that, but um, that's written down there is what NICE says about it. And um, basically with an LP, don't do it if the child's really, really unwell with any of those things. Um, and you wouldn't generally do it if they've got the rash, but in all other cases, it would be your kind of your first thing you'd do. So here we have your causative organisms, which may have maybe seen last year, but these can be so with a gel and NHS mnemonic. Um, so then we move on to the treatment. So if you see the rash when they present to hospital, you give antibiotics straight away before even before any maybe investigations, probably get the blood cultures first, but you're wanting to get antibiotics in them as soon as possible. Uh, and if they don't have the rash, then if you see any abnormality on LP, even if it's kind of a viral looking picture, but any abnormality, any white blood cells, anything like that, you give the antibiotics straight away until you get CSF cultures back, confirming that it's bacterial or not. Uh, so in the very young, so under three months, you give a uh, cefetazamine instead of keftriaxone. Uh, it's just a little niche exam point is that 
kef in the very young is associated with i think it's called biliary sludging you can get biliary problems high bilirubin um if you give it in the very young children and remember to cover for listeria in the very young as well with amox or ampicillin then there's the steroids question so i remember stressed this last year but don't give steroids in the very young so in under three months and then if you've got suspected bacterial meningitis you would give them because steroids can reduce sensory neurohearing loss in either h influenzae or strep pneumo but if there's the rash you wouldn't give it on to the next sba So this child has acute epiglottitis um, and generally in any threatened peds airways you probably want to leave it well alone and get an anesthetic or ENT or a senior pediatrician. Um, so IV antibiotics and fluids might be involved in the management um, kind of further down the line but the initial thing is to secure the airway so call someone who's specialised to deal in that. Uh, if they were found to ha have acute epiglottitis, you might give rifampicin to the contacts, but all of this is quite rare nowadays since we vaccinate against Haemophilus influenzae B. Um, so your non-infective causes of airway obstruction in kids are generally more common. So you've got laryngomalacia, which is basically just a floppy airway. It's quite common actually, and it's also associated with Down syndrome. Again, you generally leave them alone unless it's really bad. Uh, foreign body is a really important cause. Um, and so consider a chest X-ray or even scoping if you kind of really suspect it. And then in your whole tracheitis versus epiglottitis can be quite hard to tell, but uh, they'll be much more ill. They might say a toxic appearing or like the drooling of the saliva is very classic in epiglottitis. And in tracheitis, you get this kind of viral prodrome it's quite typical. Um, so I think with anaphylaxis, I think it's worth at least worth knowing the adrenaline doses. The other ones kind of known, the pediatric ones is probably less important, but I would learn the three doses for different age groups for adrenaline. Now on to cardiovascular disease, the last thing we'll cover today. And an SBA. So I've seen this question kind of go a bit either way, um, but I think the first thing you should be doing in a child when it's kind of getting to the point when the ducts it might close and you're looking at a congenital cardiac disease potentially, uh, which is shown by the kind of five over 5% 5 difference in the pre versus postductal sats is you want to keep the duct open and you do that with prostaglandin or alprostadil. Um, and it's never a bad idea. Whereas high flow oxygen, if you over oxygenate them, you can cause the ducts to close, which could cause a deterioration in any duct dependent lesion. So um, what we're talking about when we say cyanosis, I think it's important to clarify, it's probably central cyanosis. So peripheral, so kind of hands and feet, uh, cyanosis can be called acrocyanosis. And in the first 24 hours of life, this is actually quite common. But if we're talking about central cyanosis, kind of in the mouth, the lips, that's when you start to get worried. 
So if you get a baby that's immediately cyanotic straight at birth, this is probably usually a respiratory or infective cause. Uh, the exception is something I'll mention coming up. Um, so your investigations, you probably want to localize the source of the cyanosis. So we've talked about the pre and post ductal SATs. That can give you an idea that it's a uh, cardiac lesion. But you can also do something called a nitrogen washout test. Not sure how much that's done nowadays, but um, classically you give them 100% oxygen and you take two ABGs 10 minutes apart on this oxygen. And if they're still hypoxic, it's still got a low um, PaO2. After that, then you think it's a cardiac cause because no matter how much oxygen you give them, they're still hypoxic. Um, so you generally want to, if you do think it's a congenital cardiac cause of cyanosis in the kind of newborn period, you generally want to keep the duct open. So that's your plot prostaglandin, not over oxygenating. And if it's any other causes like your resp, your sepsis, you generally want to treat those as you identify them. Another quick SBA. So the key here is cyanosis uh, straight from birth, which you think is from cardiac uh, pathology and no murmur. So generally, while, uh, while tetralogy of phthalate is more common, uh, if you've got this kind of presentation of cyanosis immediately after birth, you're looking at TGA more likely, and the no murmur is the real clincher because all there's nothing, there's no obstruction or anything, just the vessels the wrong way round. Um, so I think like the different cyanotic heart diseases, I'll go through quickly because I think people are quite good at them generally. Uh, but on your left is kind of your general overview of the murmurs and um, your real kind of cliff notes of what you go for. Um, I'll go through the main three cyanotic heart decisions quickly uh, on their own, but lesions um, can be duct dependent, and uh, so that's the ductus arteriosus. So they can be duct dependent for a number of reasons, either um, something the condition is blocking um, blood coming out of the left, the right side. So there you want the duct to kind of get have the other side com com compensate a little bit. Or in TGA, you've got them the wrong way around, so you want the blood to uh, mix a little bit through that duct. So tetralogy of phthalate is the most common, um, is the, and a presentation of it to watch out for is what's called these hypocyanotic episodes. So that's where the baby has increasing cyanosis and crying, and you get also classically get a disappearance of the murmur here. This is a life-threatening presentation, so you want to do immediate management. So you can either do uh, maneuvers or give them beta blockers and oxygen, uh, and you do that while they're waiting for surgery. And there's the nice little boot heart. Uh, TGA, you've got the nice egg on the string, um, and we've kind of talked about this mostly. Really don't want to uh, over oxygenate them or give them any NSAIDs because this can close the duct, which will lead to a very quick decompensation in these children. Uh, Coartation, you've kind of gone through a bit in fourth year. I put a slide in it, but uh, I think we'll just skip through it. And here are your, your non cyanotic uh, heart diseases. Um, so, start at ASD. So, you get that specific murmur because. Uh, you've got more blood going through the right ventricle. This is because you get a left to right shunt through that ASD. So the more blood in the right ventricle means you get a flow murmur over the pulmonary valve. So you're basically getting um, that ESM. And you also mean it means the pulmonary valve closes later, which is why you get that wide fixed splitting, which is the real classic uh, buzzword for ASD. Um, you can generally, if VSDs are small and asymptomatic, you can generally leave them alone. 
uh, important thing to note is the smaller the uh, VSD, the louder the murmur will actually be due to kind of flow over a much smaller area makes it more turbulent. Whereas the larger the blood can kind of more easily get between the two ventricles, which A is worse and B won't sound as loud. And finally, um, many children will actually have murmurs. Uh, nowadays, generally they'll be reviewed by their GP at six to eight weeks. Uh, and then many of them sent for an echo. But I think this is a really important topic as UCL love asking about it, uh, about innocent versus pathological murmurs. Um, some use the kind of seven S's uh, mnemonic, which I've kind of put in the notes of the slide. But I think it's quite important to be able to recognize an innocent versus a more, more suspicious looking murmur. So that's that's all for today. I wanted to kind of keep it quick. Um, uh, because we, we knew there was another lecture on. Um, the rest will be done on Thursday in a separate lecture. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to Ria for joining us and helping us with the slides. Um, is there any questions or issues? Yeah, we yeah, we're... Sorry, would you mind me? Because it's really echoey. Um, is there really no minimum in composition of the great arteries? One for Rhea. Hang on. Say, say that again. Is there no murmur in transposition of the great arteries? Um, to be honest, I... I don't really know. I think it's more if you find a murmur, it would be normally in anything that has sort of like an open hole. Um, so, for example, uh, like um, ASD or VSD, most of the time, if you've got a TGA, it just means that it's completely swapped over. So um, technically, the rest of the structure is all fine. It's just there's no communication with the oxygenation of the blood. So realistically, if they're asking you that in a question, it would be really harsh of them to put in a murmur if they're thinking TGA. Okay, thanks. Someone's asked, how much potassium is added to fluids in DKA management? Very good question. So I was just having a look at the DKA guidelines just here. Um, let me get to the potassium bit. Mm -hmm. So it says include 40 millimole per litre of potassium chloride in all fluids given to children and young people with DKA unless they have anuria or their potassium level is above the normal range. So just assume that you give 50, 40 millimoles per litre um, or 20 millimoles per 500 mils just as a set standard unless um, they're anuric or their potassium is above normal. Cheers, Ria. Um... Someone's asked, please, would you go through the fluid stuff again? Whether, Ollie, you want to do that or Ray, I'm not sure. Um, is there anything specific in mind with the fluids or um, just to kind of go through the calculation again? We'll just wait for a response. Just the calculations, please. And then uh, someone asks, where did the number 300 come from? Okay. Um, Ollie, are you happy for me to go through that or do you want to go through it? I, I'm easy. Um, I, I, I can go through it since it was kind of it was my, uh, my stuff that I put on there and the numbers and all that. Um, so the 300 number came from the initial bolus. So um, as we said, um, any child that has DKA that you think needs IV fluids but isn't shocked, uh, you give this 10 mil per kilo bolus, and that does get taken away from the total maintenance amount. So in this child, it's 30 kilos. That would be a 300 mil bolus, um, which then gets taken away from the, um, the deficit. So that's where the 300 comes from. Again, to quickly run through, so the 3,000 number comes from they've got a 10% deficit because we said they have severe DKA, so that's 10% fluid deficit. Um, so 10% of uh, 30 kilos is three kilos, 
or three, which is three liters of fluid. And that's those two numbers, the 3,000 and 300, are used to calculate the total deficit. And you do that, replace that over 48 hours. And then the 1,700 is the total maintenance fluid they need anyway. And you'd give them that to them over 24 hours. Please let me know if there's any more stuff about DKA fluids that you'd like to know. We haven't got any more questions at the moment, but while we're on Pete's, um, unless everyone wants to go to that other lecture that's on, Ria, would you tell us a bit about what it's like to actually work in Pete's? Uh, you're asking the wrong person because my Pete's rotation actually got cancelled because of redeployment. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about Pete's a &E. So I spent six months in a &E as an F2. Um, and depending on what trust you're in, our a &E also allowed us to do PEDS a &E. So some places just have the paediatric team covering that and some places just have the a &E team covering PEDS. Um, so I would say that in terms of paediatrics, a &E, you see a lot of uh, over the Christmas time, winter time, you see a lot of viral induced wheeze, a lot of bronch, um, a lot of uh, sort of acute yeah. asthma attacks just because that's the sort of right time of the year for that to all brew up. Um, a lot of head injuries because kids yeah. start to run around and bonk their head anywhere. Um, and so you get really, in terms of um, emergencies, it might be good to also go over nice guidelines of head injuries because it is slightly different to um, adults as when you require a CT. Um, very specific in terms of um, neurology and episodes of vomiting. So if you're a little bit iffy, it might just be worth going through that. Um, um, a lot of broken bones, but I think that you guys can ignore that for UCL finals. Um, and just infection. So uh, Ollie went through sepsis really well. Um, and like like he said, hypertension is a really, really late stage. So if in your experience or when you start working, when you've just got a nurse saying, I'm just really worried about this child, I think they're quite unwell, take it seriously. They have a really good traffic light system anyway. Uh, and it's just always worth running it through with the PEDS team in the first place. Neonates is very, very different. Um, I've done a taste a week in so paediatric surgery, neonates and um, ICU. So that was a very, very different um, ball game. Um, just wanted to touch on um, prematurity. So when we went over the topics of prematurity and giving um, surfactant and prostaglandin and stuff like that, for respiratory distress, sometimes they also give caffeine. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen that in your placements when you're in NICU, but that's basically to help with um, apneic episodes and um, to sort of enable them to wean off a ventilator because sometimes preemie babies find it really difficult to be weaned off. So if that question comes up as why um, someone's prescribed caffeine for neonates, that's the main reason is to help them um, sort of breathe spontaneously by themselves. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm more than happy to answer any questions for people that are interested in PEDS and sort of the whole application process, but you guys do have a whole year before you think about that in the first place. Um, yeah, I think that's as much as I can say. Can I just jump in and answer one of the questions in the chat? Um, so someone asked about why steroids aren't given in um, so it's in meningococcal septicemia. This might be a bit kind of over what you need to know, but the steroids given in meningitis are given because you want to prevent the new, the deafness that you can get as a um, as a sequelae in, and that's specifically in strep pneumo or in Haemophilus influenzae. So if you've got the rash and you know it's not is being caused by Neisseria meningitis rather than those other two so that you'd, um, there's no real point in giving them. Also, if someone's got the rash, they're pretty unwell. You might not want to give them steroids as they're probably fighting a pretty life-threatening infection. Ligati asks, um, how do you work out the amount of deficit um, with regards to the three litre value that was discussed? Um, uh, okay, um, so again, the three litre deficit is if we go back, um, so the key thing is from this bit in the bottom right, 
So if so, what you do is in a question, you're probably given an ABG, and that would have a blood pH, a bicarb value, and um, you then quantify them into either the mild, moderate, severe. As I said, for you for UCI SBA, it's probably going to be severe. And um, what you do is so that's if you've got the pH is say 7.05, they'll get bicarb of two. Then you say, okay, this person has severe DKA, and we're going to assume a 10% fluid deficit. And so with a child who is 30 kilograms, 10% um, of 30 kilos is three kilos or three liters of fluid. And that's where the three liters number comes from. Cool. All right. Well, there's no more questions. Should we let these guys get off to MedSoc? And I'll end the recording there. Yeah. Um, please do feedback and we'll see you on Thursday. And thank you very much, Ria. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Ria. Thank you.